Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We're in Joshua, and we're going to be doing chapter 18 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, as we begin here in chapter 18, let's read verse 1. And it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled uh, together at Shiloh, and they set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. Now, the tabernacle is now being removed from Gilgal to Shiloh, and Shiloh is about 12 miles south of Shechem, and it's about 18 to 20 miles northwest of Gilgal. And Shiloh is considered to be somewhat in the midst of the promised land. Remember, we said Shechem. Shechem was, is the city that was between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and towards the middle of the uh, land of Canaan. Now, why why the tabernacle and the ark were removed at this time and why take it to Shiloh is not mentioned. But God must have moved upon <coughs> Joshua to relocate the tabernacle there. Now, if we look at it from a natural viewpoint, we see that at this time, there are only seven tribes left to still have their land given to them. And what that means is that the two and a half tribes uh, have their land on the east side of the Jordan River. And Judah and Ephraim and Manassas, well, they were given the land to the south, the south part of the uh, land of Canaan. And the land that is yet to be given out would be to the north. So basically, the only land that's left uh, to be portioned out is to the north, uh, up around the Sea of Galilee and uh, in that area and even up farther north. Now, we do not know that if since the coming, since the children of Israel came through the Jordan River, if they still continued to camp around the tabernacle as they did when they were in the wilderness. But if the people of these southern tribes did start to possess their land, then the tabernacle would no longer be totally surrounded. There would be gaps in, uh, there would be gaps where the tribe of uh, the tribe Manassas and uh, Ephraim and also of Gad and Reuben, they're gone now. So they they their their spot around the tabernacle would be open. So it's possible that the tabernacle that God wanted it moved up to the center of the promised land in order for a little more protection, possibly. Again, we don't know because it's not stated. Now the tabernacle was basically in the center of the promised land. And the ark would stay. Now the ark is going to stay in Shiloh for about the next 300 years until the sins of Eli's sons caused it to be, to, to be lost in battle to the Philistines. But it was actually God who removed from his people, he removed the ark from his people to the Philistines. And why? Well, because, because of the lack of respect and honor to God and to his word. God had it removed from Shiloh. Why? Because the people got familiar. The son, uh, Eli, his sons, were committing terrible sins, and God had enough. The children of Israel and the priests had let some familiarity creep in. 
Eli's sons had committed great sins in their service at the tabernacle. And now it was time to pay. The cup of their sins was now full. The same can, ha you know, the same thing can happen with us. When we begin to stray from God, then because God, out of his compassion and grace, because he does not immediately discipline us, then we are tempted to still go farther in our sins until God has to chasten us. If we continue in sin, then God will turn his face from us. Again, that doesn't mean that we lose our salvation. It just means that we, God can't have fellowship with us if we're, gonna, if we're going to continue to entertain sins in our hearts. Stay fresh with God. Don't let familiarity creep in. If you sense a familiar attitude growing in your heart, then you need to spend time with God and remember, listen, remember that you and I, we all we are is just dust. We're just dust. Don't, don't, don't put too much upon yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself, as Paul said. No, no, we're just dust. God is everything in our life. All that you have and all that you are is only because of God's grace. Don't think, again, don't think too highly of yourself. The seven, now let's read verse two. Uh, and there remained among the uh, children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Now, these seven tribes are Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. Now let's read verses 3 through 10. And we have here the dividing of the rest of the land. So it says here, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, how long are you slack to go and to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coasts to on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. You shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description here to me that I may cast lots for you before the Lord your God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And the men arose, and they went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land, and describe it, and come again to me that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land, and they described it by cities into seven parts in a book. And they came again to Joshua, uh, to the host uh, at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. Now, 45 years ago, when the 12 spies sent were sent out by Moses, it does not say how far up into the land of Canaan they went. We do not know if they made it up into the north part of the land of Canaan. But now, the Northland has been taken, and Joshua sends out three men from each tribe 
to view and to describe the land and the cities. Now, according to verse 9, it seems that the, divide, the division of the land was made by these 21 men. It seems that these 21 men, they went out, they compassed the whole land, they saw it, and then they themselves, these 21 men, decided to divide the land how they saw it. And all Joshua would have to do would be to basically cast lots and to give each tribe one of those portions that was already divided up. It doesn't seem that Joshua and Eleazar and uh, anyone else actually divided the land. These 21 men, it's believed, they, they divided the land up. Now, the tribe, the tribes of Judah, Ephraim, and Manassas are pretty much gone now to their land. And it is up now to the last seven tribes to care for themselves. When these tribes would be given their land, probably a portion of their land would be still inhabited by Canaanites, just like Caleb's was. Caleb, God gave Caleb his portion of land, but he had to go in and, and chase out the Canaanites, drive them out. They were still there. Now, this, because Canaanites were still, possibly still in parts of this land that was being divided up, this would give each tribe a reason to drive out the Canaanites from the land. Now, in verse 3 of what we just read, Joshua asks a question, and he says, How long are you slack to possess the land? Now, this question brings up two thoughts. The first thought is this, that Joshua would not receive any inheritance until the tribes got theirs first. Joshua's unselfishness is an example that all pastors can learn from. You know, the people, <clears throat> the people in a church always come first. The pastor is only there to serve the people. There are too many, listen, there are too many churches where the people feel obligated to the pastor. Almost to the point to where the church is there to serve the pastor. And it's not that way. It shouldn't be that way. The pastor is there to serve the church, to serve the people. He's there to be God's representative, to speak God's word to those people, to their, their hearts. He's not there for them to serve him. No, no. He's there for, for, for himself to serve them, to be God's servant to these people. That's what he's there for. And Joshua would not take any inheritance until it was all divided up and given out. And, uh, you know, yes, the people do, the people in a church do tithe. They, they can bless the pastor. Uh, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But sometimes it goes too far, too far to the point where the pastor makes a lot of money and maybe it's a big mega church or whatever. And it's almost like you almost feel like it's a privilege that you have the opportunity to walk in the door. <laughs> And that's wrong. I'm telling you, that is absolutely wrong. You, you, the pastor is there to serve the people. It is not the other way around. The pastor is not to be, if, if you go, if you go to a church and you never see your, you don't, the only time you see your pastor is, is Sunday when he gets up behind the pulpit to preach because your church is so big and so whatever. That's not right. I'm sorry, that's just not right. The pastor of the main pastor of the church is to serve the people, to make sure they're served. It's, it's, it's all backwards in some churches. The second lesson we learn here is how long, listen, how long will we be slack to take possession of the promises that God has given to us today? 
God has made available to each Christian exceeding great and precious promises. And if we hold to those promises, then we will be a partaker of God's divine nature. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. We need to grab a hold of God's exceeding great. And How long? How long is it going to be before we stand on the word of God and claim his promises for us? They're there. God's already, like, like God gave the children of Israel the land, God has given you promises in his word. And when are we going to grab a hold of them and take them? Every day we live is a spiritual battle against worldliness and against sin. And God has provided truths and promises for us to press on into maturity with him. The re listen, the reason why a Christian would be slack to possess God's promises is either because of spiritual tiredness or because of fear of the enemy. Always remember, if God has given us promises, then our enemy can never defeat us, no matter how big or how powerful the enemy is. Listen, remember, remember this next statement. The issue, listen, the issue is never how big and how powerful our enemy is, but it is always the condition of our walk with God. It's not, the issue is never how big, how big and powerful the enemy is. The issue in, in, in victory over the enemy has to do with our walk with God. If we're, if we're humble, if we're confessed up to date, if we're walking in the fear, oh, I'm not saying we don't sin. Of course we sin. But if we, if we confess our sins and we continue walking and we're praying and we're humble and we're reading and studying and meditating upon his word and we're doing, we're obeying God's word to the best of our ability. You know what? Nothing can stand before you. Nothing can. No weapon that is formed can stand before you. Why? Because the issue is never how big or powerful the enemy is. Victory over the enemy is determined upon your walk with God. That's what it is. That's what it is. Listen, how many times in the Old Testament was Israel outnumbered? Outnumbered by, by people, by horses, by chariots. I'm telling you, in Je and with Jehoshaphat, he was surrounded. Jehoshaphat was, the, the city of Israel was surrounded. And in one night, listen, one night, he, hum he humbled himself and he prayed to God. He gave his heart to God and he prayed to him and he humbled himself. And he says in, 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 in uh, 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12, Oh, our God, will you not, will you not? judge them for we have no might we have no might against this great company that comes against us but our eyes are unto thee our eyes our eyes are unto thee god we have no might against this great company that comes against us but you know what you're bigger than them and that night that night god sent the angel 185,000 were killed that night by the angel that god sent you know what? You know what the Jehoshaphat and his army did? They did nothing. They did. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't. Have, they were outnumbered. They couldn't defeat the enemy. God came. God delivered them. Listen. It's never how big and how powerful you, their enemy is. It's always about your walk with God. God can deliver you no matter what. All right. Now. In verses, in chapter 18, verses 11 through 28, uh, we're not going to be reading that, but it's basically in that portion of scripture, it's the portion of land that was given to Benjamin, to the tribe of Benjamin. All right, we're going to continue on in chapter 19, next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.